guess when Anna's ready. I'm ready. I guess she says she's ready. Yeah. So let's do this. Let me add us on Facebook. Hello. Hello, hello. You hear me? Okay. <clears throat> so we I think we have a name now. It's Anna and Rose Ronan's Historical Book Club. <laughs> Yeah. How's everybody tonight? Sweaty. I don't like it. <laughs> okay. So I'm very excited because <clears throat> you with me, Rose? You with I'm me, Rose? With you. Okay. Okay. I'm really excited because um, I am going to be doing an event for my hero, a guy called Bayard Reston. So we're going to start off tonight by talking about Bayard. Let's do it. Okay. So <clears throat> Bayard Rustin was a black American um, man, gay man. He was born in 1912. And um, for people who do know about him, they know him as a hero of the civil rights movement. But... Um, he had been doing direct action and advocating for 25 years before that. And he was a mentor to Dr. Martin Luther King. And he does not get enough, get enough credit for that. And the reason that not so many people know about Bayard was because um, he stepped to, he stepped aside because people threatened the movement. They threatened to expose his homo his homosexuality to discredit the civil rights movement, right. and Martin Luther King turned his back on him. Um, so that's an interesting historical question because we could criticize King for that. But we can also look at the reality of his time and that this was a movement and that this was something big and that I think I'm, Bayard Reston was a brilliant tactician and he would have understood right. that. But there were other examples in Bayard's life where he needed to step aside because of homophobia and he worked for the Fellowship for Reconciliation for many years. He was a pacifist. He was a brave, brave man. And he lost his job working for the Fellowship of Reconciliation after he was picked up by the cops in Pasadena um, for, you know, having sex in a car. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And he was supposed to... I guess suppress himself and he was very close to the director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation a guy called AJ Musty it was like a father to him and so the message he was getting was it was wasn't so much there's something wrong with you but just like don't do this right, okay right. and <clears throat> Um, so he and so that was okay. So that was in 1953, but he'd been doing a lot before then. Bayard be started out working with A. Philip Randolph, who started the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Right. Yeah, and you know, shit. Our con. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There we. Here we go. You know, we and it's just. Okay, we start talking about an outstanding African-American person that's not too well known, and from there we just keep moving and right, moving. Right, right. And that was really what got me going on studying history was when I learned about Bayard about 10 years ago. I saw a film called Brother Outsider, and... It just made me realize how much is out there that I didn't know about. And 
So I started learning about Byard Rustin, and in order to learn about Byard Rustin, you need to learn about A. Philip Randolph. Right, right. And Rustin was raised as a Quaker, and so that's also something that was very import important to him. There were... How many black Quakers do you think was... A lot. No, there was a lot back there? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, there was a movement. Um, and actually, shoot, I was meaning to look up the major figures in, in that, and I forgot. But, yeah, um, there's a writer named Jean Toomer who was a um, leader for Quaker African, African Americans. Um, yeah, so that's a whole other piece. Okay, next, next podcast. Nice, nice, nice. <laughs> So, um, and I'm it up. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, and <clears throat> Bayard always said that his work in the civil rights movement and in nuclear disarmament and everything was based in being a Quaker, in belief in doing good and the value of all of us, of ev of everyone. Um, so the other thing that Bayard was doing, and that oh okay, so going back a little bit, he was raised in a big family in Pennsylvania, and he was raised by his grandparents as his parents. When he was older, he found out that his sister was actually his mother. Not an uncommon life ex life experience. Um, I think I better hold. I don't. I don't know about about that. Um, so he was an outstanding student, and even as a high schooler, as a child, he was pushing boundaries of segregation. He would go sit in the movie theater where he wanted to sit, and he had friends of all races. He was just always someone who did his own his own thing and he was a talented athlete he was a talented musician i mean the guy could just do anything pretty much and so in the night he went to college and then um dropped out and that may have had something to do with his homosexuality it's hard to tell mm. and <clears throat> so he went to new york and joined the Young Communist League. And so, the, and at that time, the communists were the most socially conscious group that there, that there was. Right. And a lot of progressives, just about anybody that was progressive in the 1930s was Part of it was part of it. It wasn't, and I forget the name of the actual organization, but it wasn't even what we would consider communist or what was considered communism 10 years later. But the issue for Bayard throughout his life was, okay, why are you in this group? Okay, what do you think as a black man in the 1930s? Okay, what are the communists going to do for you? Or like, what are the pacifists right. going to do for you? And that's just something that just happens all the time now. I mean, people are still going to get pressured. Like, okay, you're in this movement, but what about this movement? What about this movement? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So that was what was happening with Bayard, and so he um, believed that the working for the labor the labor unions, I mean, was working for civil for for civil rights, and well, they didn't even really call it civil rights civil rights back then. Um, so Bayard was um, an extremely charismatic and charming. Person. He was a good speaker and educator. He had lots of friends. And, okay, here's the sort of thing that shows you how to look at history more carefully. Um, I was rereading a book about Bayer to prepare for tonight, and I came across something I'd seen before, which was comments from somebody in the Fellowship of Reconciliation saying, that um, Bayard only spent time with white people. And, you know, I remember 
I wouldn't have paid attention to that when I read the book 10, year, 10 years ago, but I was looking at it now and I'm thinking like, well, you were one of his white friends, okay? Right, right. <laughs> so, right. okay, yeah. You know, Bayard had a life apart from you. You know, to me, he was a social, charismatic pers person. He always, like, went all over the place. I'm sure he had plenty of black friends, and I'm sure that, I mean, at that time, I'm sure he was friends with other gay black people who would have been closeted or who were... Shit, I don't like that word, or who would have been not publicly gay or something. Right. So it's an example of looking at, okay, who's telling you the story? Right, right. Okay, so um, Bayard was a conscientious objector in um, World War II, and, conscien and that was based on his Quaker belief. And so consci conscientious objectors could... Um, go to farms or something and just be kind of out of the way and do community service sort of stuff. And Bayer decided that he needed to be in the forefront, so he went to prison. Wow. Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, for his values and ideals. I don't think I would do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think. Would I? Well, you know, what's in prison a little bit? Different back then? No, it was no, it was bad. It like, I don't know. It seemed like it wouldn't have been as bad. I don't know. Really? I don't know. That's my thoughts. <laughs> oh no, no, it was it was pre it was pretty it was pretty bad. Oh okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know, think you know, I would like do prisons it. nowadays. You know, you know, sure. gangs and stuff like back then they didn't really have. Oh, they did. Like this though? Like you think yeah. it was this? Oh wow. Okay, I didn't know that. Well, there's. I mean, well, we're going to have, the reason behind a lot of crime in prison is going to be to get stuff, right. and so the factors that are going to make people get in gangs and prisons have to do with prisons. Right. So, yeah, they were always pretty bad, but so, Bayard got there and started working on combating segregation in the prison, okay? Ooh, He's hard. just, yeah, wherever <laughs> the guy was, he was an act, he was an activist. I mean, he would go sit where he wanted to sit in the cafeteria, whatever the whatever they call, I don't know if they call prison cafeterias or whatever. And um, he taught a class. Um, I don't remember what it was about to white prisoners, and even that was a big deal. Yeah, okay. yeah. So and he did this to, and there was a to show that being a nonviolent pacifist wasn't being a wimp, that non that non nonviolence is brave and nonviolence is action. Nonviolence right. is not just sitting back and not and not doing anything. And there was a lot of other conscientious objectors at the prison. The story goes that um, some white guy came in and started like attacking Bayard and Bayard like covered his head and just told the other conscientious objectors not to pull the guy off of him. He was that nonviolent. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so that was all about 1946, okay? So this was all the stuff Byard was doing before 19, 1946. And one of the things there is that he was always challenging segregation. That did not start in the 60s by any means. Um, and so in 1946, something um, called the Morgan Decision passed through the, the Supreme Court, and it's named after a woman named Irene Morgan, um, who challenged inter who challenged the rules on segregation for interstate buses. So they made it federal law that buses needed to be desegregated. Right. So in 1947, Byard and a group of his um, associates 
started something called the Journey of Reconciliation, mm -hmm. riding buses across the country and going through Jim Crow states. Wow. Yeah. And that's crazy. Yeah. 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 And what, 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 what year was this? 1947. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You can see why I just, when I learned it at this guy, it, it was just such a light bulb. Like, wow, all of this was happening. There's, right. Yeah. That's crazy. That's yeah. crazy for 1946. Yeah. yeah. So. You learn something new every day. You do. You do. I do. <laughs> and um, so to step back again from the lesson of Bayard Rustin, there's just so many things to keep looking. I mean, that don't just look at what you've been told, keep going, keep inquiring. And Bayard was always doing something. And in, so that was 1947, and then in 1953 was when he was arrested and was fired from the Fellowship of Reconciliation and from the American Friends Service Committee, the Quakers. And so then he started working, he was hired by the War Resistance League, and it was a small world, okay? It was a lot of the same people, but people in the War Resistance League were, I don't know, a little bit more down in the mix, you could say, and were pretty much like, okay, we don't want to, we're not gonna ask him to like be, sell, sort of like, okay, this is him, okay? And somebody even said Bayard's urges seem unnatural to us, but not to him. And he's an astounding organizer, speaker, educator, everything. We're going to bring him back. So that's what happened. And that, that's what Bayard was doing in the night in the 1950s. But um, the when he was arrested, the head of the Fellowship of Reconciliation sent out letters like notifying all the chapters right okay but in 1953 it was mixed like he said he did it so that people wouldn't be surprised or whatever by the news but he could have just not done anything people wouldn't have known right, right. you know right. i mean it's 1950 i mean it's it's not like it was going to be posted on facebook right now considering that he was doing this in 1946 1950 what were some of his, uh, how should I say, what were some of his sparks growing up that you think made him decide to oh, be like this? You think his grandmother. Gotcha. His grandmother was a Quaker. Okay. And uh, so she was very active in, in, active in that movement, and there were other. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that's deep for his grandmother back then. I it's mean, so real that's a deep. long time ago. Yeah. So, you know, that's just. So it's kind of like, you could just kind of say it's in his blood. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And there were other, I mean, I believe W.E.D. E. Du Bois, I mean, there were outstanding leader, African-American leaders that came through his household when he was a child. He was Malcolm X. Right, right. Too. I mean, so, yeah, so that is where he came, that is where it came from. And his grandmother was always very, very close to him. Um, she was waiting for him when he got out of prison. Wow. Yeah. That's good, though. Yeah. That's how it's supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. And they knew why they, I mean, we're sad that he did it, but they supported him, what, right. he, what, he, was, right. what he was doing. So that was the 1950s. And what Bayard was doing quite, well, he did a lot of traveling. He went and met Nehru, uh, I met, President Nehru. So Bayard instructed Martin Luther King about Gandhi and nonviolence. I mean, Bayard was there in the 50s. I mean, I think he made his first visit to India in the, the late 40s. Right. So, um, and he was visiting um, other African nations during the during the 1950s and they were trying to work on disarmament. I mean, it's just crazy thinking back on, okay, people, the nuclear war was so real to people then. Right, A right. bomb had been dropped and they knew about it, but then in the U.S., 
there was a lot of nas of nationalism and the pacifists were not that popular at the time because World War II was a good war. Right, right. Like, okay, we were fighting bad guys. And so even amongst the pacifist movement, it was kind of, it was a little bit more difficult to try and communicate what they were doing. Right, right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you said you had...